Okay, it's great to be here tonight. I'm glad so many people could make it. Um, yeah, keep it brief here, but uh, I do want to mention, welcome everyone here tonight. And uh, I do want to mention in our membership numbers have reached an all-time high. And uh, if you know of anyone that might be interested in joining, please refer them to our website. And uh, or people that haven't renewed yet, you know, you can update your membership. It's cheap, it's $15 a person, so it's very inexpensive. And Good evening, everyone. I'm Todd Miller. Uh, Toby Chapman and I are the program coordinator. There's Toby. Uh, and uh, as Wayne mentioned, we have an <coughs> engaging program for you this evening. Our speaker, Lizzie Barker, is executive director of the Frick Pittsburgh, and is leading the effort to deepen the museum's engagement with the communities it serves, including audiences that haven't traditionally uh, regarded the Frick as a place for them. Uh, tonight, she'll share what the future holds for the museum and how that future connects to our shared history in Pittsburgh. Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, present Lizzie Barker. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. This is my first time trying to use both hands with a microphone <laughs> and the slide. So if I get it mixed up, just shout and say, Lizzie, we can't hear you. I was given the very modest topic this evening of everything in the universe to do with the Frick Pittsburgh. Our past, our present, our future. Better still, I'm going to try to fit it into 20 to 30 minutes so there will be time for conversation afterwards. If you become terribly bored, make some sort of symbol before you faint. <laughs> what, to begin, is a museum? Well, our founder, the indomitable Miss Helen Clay Frick, at the time she inherited the majority of her father's industrial wealth, America's single wealthiest heiress, she had very clear ideas what a museum might be. Yeah. In her case, she wanted above all to memorialize her family's life and her father's achievements by preserving a childhood home she realized was quickly becoming a relic of a past generation. Later on, when she had a celebrated falling out with the University of Pittsburgh, which we will not discuss at length until the Q&A, she picked up some of her toys and created her own museum building, which opened in 1970. For Miss Frick, then, a museum was, in a sense, a treasury of extraordinary objects worthy of protection, and a kind of archive, an extraordinary research reference that could be used to understand lives from the past. But of course, we know that Miss Frick's museum has grown and changed. If you haven't visited lately, I encourage you to come back. The parking lot is reopened. <laughs> this, of course, is the mansion that began her enterprise. This is her art museum. And now, on a 10-acre campus, we have eight other buildings, most of which are open to you to explore. So of course, our definition of the museum has changed. It has become a place where, in fact, you could have a yoga class, but more generally, you might meditate or seek solace in a time of challenge. It's become a place where you can engage with other people in animated conversation or in a romantic stroll here on Valentine's Day. You might even engage with members of the community in activities that, at first glance, have nothing whatsoever to do with art or history. What, then, is the Frick now, and what will it become? That's the question we'll spend most of our time tonight talking about, and about which I would value your input. We hope, in a nutshell, to be an extraordinary blend of all of these things, and if this sounds impossibly optimistic or inefficient, reflect on our business model. We operate a small art museum, a small historic house museum, a small transportation museum, a small botanic garden and greenhouse, the world's littlest but best cafe with all of 20 chairs, <laughs> and a perfect shop if you're still looking to get your special someone a gift certificate. 
We are charting our course for the future with a strategic plan based on three key principles. And if you really can't sleep tonight, in the back of the room <laughs> is a complete published copy of the full strategic plan with an update on our progress, several pages. But the key points are these. We want to focus on access to the Frick. We care deeply about our ethical responsibility of stewardship. And we're focused on interpretation as, in a sense, the doorway to all that we do. In the stewardship bucket, we have many goals that we seek to achieve in the next seven years, but they fall under a couple of large categories. It's essential that we be a going business concern, a well-managed not-for-profit, and we are. It's also important that we continue to preserve the structures and collections entrusted to our care. Why am I showing you a picture of an iPhone? Well, the best way to summarize the business work that lies ahead of us has to do with technology. The most exciting experience you will see will take us, we estimate, three years and a great deal of funds. We want to stop giving you the digital equipment of equivalent of going to Giant Eagle and getting the shopping cart with a wobbly wheel, and we'd rather give you a more frictionless digital experience. We also want to be even more up-to-date in the kinds of offerings that we can share when it comes to live streaming a presentation or letting you see a work of sculpture in all dimensions when you go to our collection catalog. We're also caring at what seems to be an ever-increasing pace for the collections entrusted to our care, and the great treasure that we hold is Clayton. I'm showing you a close-up of a chimney that has been cleaned by an expert team over the course of weeks because when you see scaffolding as you pass the house now, you'll notice we're in the process of restoring all five chimneys thanks to a generous grant from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We've recently cleaned the Juliet balcony it looks so beautiful, it's giving us ideas about painting the rest of the house. And we've restored the stunning dome over Henry Clay Frick's luxurious bathroom. If this were in my house today, it would be the most luxurious room in the house, and imagine what it would have been like in 1905. It's stunning. The mess that we're making now is to replace the roof of the Car and Carriage Museum so that all of the instruments, um, all of the vehicles, that we store there are weatherproof, and you have a more pleasant experience without tripping over the occasional rain buckets. Our next phase, about which we're tremendously excited, is to restore the exterior of Clayton, replace what in some places we believe is as many as 28 layers of paint, the family redecorated, and then repaint the house in one of the paint schemes still to be determined by our curators and illuminate it so that it looks like the extraordinary public resource that it truly is. Moving to the next plank of our strategic plan, access. We had a wonderful time with our board of trustees identifying this as central to everything we do. And it may seem simple, but this isn't the way museums used to do their work. We used to put the collections at the center of the enterprise and almost think of our guests as extremely lucky to have the privilege of walking through our doors. That's not how we do business now. In fact, at the Frick, our overarching value is one we call radical empathy, moving beyond the golden rule to the platinum rule, treating others as they would actually like to be treated. That means we need to meet our visitors' basic human needs we want them not to get lost, either on the web trying to find something or when they come to our site. And we want a far broader range of visitors than have felt comfortable at the Frick before to feel comfortable at our place. I'm sure I don't need to tell this knowledgeable audience that the Frick is located at the intersection of a well-to-do, predominantly white, extremely safe neighborhood. And directly across the street is a predominantly African-American underserved, high poverty, high violence neighborhood. And many of our neighbors we would love to welcome to our site, who live on the north side of Penn Avenue, don't feel that the Frick is a place for them. And that is the moral, as well as the business imperative, that's driving many of our decisions at the Frick. 
When it comes to human needs, we started by taking advantage of the temporary closure of our cafe during the pandemic to reimagine the service model so that more people could find something to eat during their visit. We added a few things to the menu, we made it quicker, we're now serving twice as many people as we did before. We know many people miss the white linen tablecloths, but we're glad that we can give our visitors a, a richer experience. There aren't many other restaurants in our neighborhood, and we discovered that most visitors were seeing one or two of our three museums, but could never see all three because they had to leave for another neighborhood. We've made more kid-friendly items on the menu, but we're discovering that what most kids really love is the high tea for one. <laughs> they have the wonderful ritual of watching the hot water seep over the leaves and pouring it out. And I, I received this charming message from a family that had a great experience right around the holidays and thought I'd get a kick out of seeing their little girl pour her own tea. We're also attending to the way people navigate our campus. And although there's not much we can do with Pittsburgh's hilly terrain, we can make it a little bit easier if you visit us using a cane or a walker or a wheelchair or a stroller. We've not only repaved the parking lot, but created, for the first time, a link to the city sidewalk, which is here, so that anyone can enter our campus. I was just walking in one day after getting a sandwich at lunch and was thrilled to see someone pushing a stroller up the sidewalk as if it had always been there. It's the way it should be. We've also corrected several of the curb cuts so that it's a smoother passage and improved the handicapped parking on site. Perhaps most spectacularly, we've illuminated the pathways and some of the buildings, making it safer to navigate at night and much more inviting. We think of ourselves as an extension of Frick Park. We hope if you don't already know that you can visit, that you will feel welcome to visit. We keep the gates unlocked until dusk, which is quite late in the summer, and it's a really lovely place to come and bring a picnic or a book or a friend. Next month, we are opening an infant care room, and ours will be even prettier than this photograph I found on the web. It will have a place to feed a baby and change a baby, maybe just sit down with some little ones and catch your breath for a moment in a room that's safe and clean, if you know our museum store, the person who is walking through this doorway is actually walking into the space that will be the infant care center. Of course, part of making diverse audiences feel at home at the Frick requires extra work on behalf of our team, including bringing new colleagues onto the, onto the team. And I'm showing you a photo of our incredibly dynamic new assistant manager of interpretation, Amanda Devanjo Awanjo, who is here giving a tour of the folk art exhibition that recently closed. She has a PhD in English literature, but is a natural working with visitors on guided conversations. Of course, we're also diversifying the kinds of programs that we offer, and here you're seeing Pittsburgh's own Kia serenading us during a recent winter concert. And I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't recognize our extraordinary artist, Vanessa German, who is the Frick's artist in residence for a five-year period. We're only in the middle year of this, and we have many more exciting things to come. We were deeply honored when Vanessa reached out to us as her neighborhood museum in the early quarantine days of the pandemic and wanted to explore a project. This is the first iteration of the project, an installation in the room of Italian Renaissance altarpieces in which Vanessa has created her own altarpiece as a site of meditation, reflection, and community reconciliation. Her altarpiece serves as a memorial to black lives lost to police violence, and she's memorializing George Floyd in the center, Breonna Taylor, and Elijah McClain. Sadly, this piece feels even more relevant now than we had hoped it would by 2023. As part of her residency, Vanessa traced a route from the artist residency that she runs in this house all the way to the Frick campus and envisioned something she called the Blue Walk, 
a ritual ceremony inspired by African mourning traditions in which a group of women processed through Homewood, engaging community members as they went, handing out flowers, stopping to talk to neighbors, pausing to recite and compose poetry on the spot. I served as one of the crossing guards for this. It's possible I'm wearing a bright yellow vest in the background of the photograph. And the event culminated with a performance on the terrace in front of the art museum. As we rounded the corner, we were incredibly moved to find perhaps 200 people waiting, waiting patiently while we had made the walk from the art house for this incredibly beautiful performance. We've been thrilled that since we opened her show, we've seen a much broader kind of visitor come to the Frick than we used to see typically in the, in the past. We certainly have very far to go, but at least we've put our foot on the first step at the base of the mountain we know we need to climb. I'm showing you a selection of photographs that our safety team takes on the weekends and posts on an internal staff website. It's really wonderful to see who might wander through on a Saturday morning who looks a little like Pittsburgh. We have a surprising number of young people who come in period costume. Did you know this was a thing? I discovered this. Of course, the sisters, bless their hearts, love to come out and look at the, look at the somewhat naughty paintings of Rococo courtship. <laughs> and families who are here to enjoy everything we have at the Frick. I'll close with the final plank that shapes the future we are committed to create with your help and that of other members of our community, which has to do with interpretation. It's essential for the Frick that we close a poignant gap. You may know that we're extremely good at welcoming school children to the Frick, but we haven't in the past done as much as we might to make families realize their kids are welcome all the time even if they're not piling off a yellow bus. And it's essential that we expand those learning experiences for families with children. We also want to align our interpretive strategy with our visitors' needs. If we want diverse audiences to feel comfortable, we need to talk about things that mean something to them. And as a, the critical aspect of all of this, we need to be attentive to our exhibition program. It is not enough to do exactly as we always did before and expect our audience to change. That responsibility lies on our shoulders. I'm showing you a group of kindergartners who filled our auditorium recently. This is one of our many teaching spaces. And we're thrilled when they come back with their parents, often for weekend festival days that we have. We're now beginning the practice of trying to include kid-friendly activities in all of the galleries, and I am embarrassed to say that what these kids are trying are something that the museum's executive director was really excited for the grown-ups to try to. <laughs> They're using their hands to replicate the motion of a car's wheels to show how hood ornaments around 1910, some of them, were made of clear glass and they would light up when the engine revved. Can you imagine? Wouldn't you love that now? <laughs> this is a felt station within the recent Romery Bearden exhibition that we had where kids could replicate some of his collages. And this was so popular that the Bearden Foundation asked if they could borrow it and they're sending it on to all of the other venues for the exhibition in the National Tour. Of course, our Summer Friday concert series has always been a popular way to engage families, and we think we want to bring some of this energy to other activities that we're doing. If you haven't come yet, you're in for a treat. Everything is free, the whole campus is open, we have wonderful bands, food trucks, our cafe got a frosé machine. It's kind of like a slushy made of rosé wine. What's not to love? <laughs> you can listen to the music. You can have a nice picnic. You can get something from a food truck. There are art making activities for kids. They're welcome to play on the lawns. And we've even started having 
a little yoga beforehand so you feel less guilty when you have that glass of wine with your picnic. <laughs> Following the success of the Summer Fridays, we just had our second annual Winter Festival to give families a chance to spend some quality time together in the fresh air when the last thing you want to do is more shopping and you've probably spent a lot of time cooped up in the house. This has involved a pop-up skating rink that we tripled in size this year and put in front of Clayton, almost as we imagined the Frick children might once have skated there. We have horse-drawn carriage rides and musical performances and art-making activities. We had the um, glass-blowing demonstrations. And, of course, one of the most critical areas of our work, one that we hope children will also feel comfortable in, is the interpretation of Clayton. And you might think the Clayton tour was already perfect. And it is an excellent tour, but we're excited by the opportunity to share broader stories. In a sense, our aim is to pull back the camera lens and show a little more of 19th century Pittsburgh that surrounded the Frick family at the time they lived there. Let me see if I can give you an example of what we're thinking of. One of the ways we're trying to make Clayton more accessible to a broad audience is by linking it to popular culture. Some of you may have watched on HBO, Julian Fellows, he who brought us Downton Abbey, has a show about life in the Gilded Age, and members of the Frick's team, who already had a successful history podcast, decided they would create a video podcast called the Unofficial Gilded Age After Show, in which we spill the tea on what was right and what may have been a little ahistorical in this week's episode. We were delighted that it attracted more than 100,000 followers on YouTube. We didn't even know how to advertise it. We understand that the series returns on HBO probably in June, and our series will be back too. It's lots of fun. We spoke with my counterparts at museums where they filmed the series. It's very entertaining if you are curious to tune in. We're also thinking a great deal about the experience of walking into the house. I was participating in an enjoyable meeting yesterday with some interpretation consultants who described the traditional way of showing a house as having it look perfect seconds before company arrives. Everything has been dusted to within an inch of its life, it's in exactly the right place, and it doesn't look as if anyone lives there. And the kind of thing that we're more interested in sharing now, of course, would be the lived experiences. So over the holidays, we imagine what would it have been like if they were carousing on New Year's Eve and left the champagne behind. We're trying to show that other people lived in the house besides the family. At various times, there may have been 20 people under that roof who were not related to the Fricks, who made their lifestyle possible. And a recent vignette demonstrated just how labor intensive it would have been to get ready for a holiday breakfast. But perhaps most poignantly, we're talking about the source of the Fricks' extraordinary wealth and how their lifestyle related and didn't relate to the workers who made it all possible. One of the most powerful comparisons our tour facilitators are beginning to share is the fact that the reception room, an incredibly elegant parlor, where for part of the day, on one day of the week, Mrs. Frick would briefly say hello to other ladies who didn't even stop long enough to remove their hat. That space was the same size as a family home for a steel worker with several children. We're noticing that for many of our visitors, that connects their own family story to the Fricks and lets us speak more broadly. Of course, it's essential that our exhibition program also reflect the diversity of the audience we're seeking to continue to grow. And I'll show you just a few of the things we've presented in recent years a wonderful exhibition of Frida Kahlo's own photograph albums, which gave a sense of how she constructed her artistic identity, <coughs> Vanessa German's installation, the exhibition of hood ornaments that had the light up hood ornament the kids were playing with, an exhibition that reimagined the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood of Victorian English artists in the context of broader labor issues and societal challenges of the time, 
our signature exhibition of last summer, which brought together two depictions of a violent Bible story by oppressed artists who succeeded against the odds 400 years apart from each other, the Romery Bearden retrospective, and coming next, a presentation we're organizing with Carnegie Mellon of Shakespeare's early printed works. This will be a show that tells the story of how close we all came to losing more than half of his collected plays and how surprisingly they've changed over time with each edition in which they've been printed. A complimentary exhibition will be on view at CMU at the same time and I encourage you to see both of them. Our show opens on April 1st. Opening on May 6th, after the roof is back on top of the Car and Carriage Museum, a wonderful exhibition exploring Pittsburgh's great mi migration and the role of the automobile in empowering African Americans from the South to move north for good jobs working in steel and elsewhere here in our city. In the fall, a wonderful exhibition of embroidery traditions made by women around the world, all sewing on a single dress developed by an English artist almost 20 years ago. Vanessa German has promised that we will receive approximately in the middle of September, but I hope you'll wait because we're not sure how difficult this will be to ship, so we'll, we'll publish the official date. Vanessa will have an outdoor art installation, not necessarily of this figure, but of one she's creating for a project on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And the terms of the mall mean that it cannot have permanent structures, and so her special commission will remain on view there from about the 4th of July to about the middle of September, and then you'll be able to see it at the Frick whenever you like. And I'm letting you know a little secret that we haven't yet announced to the media, but I know I can trust you. In a little over a year's time, so approximately 15 months from now, we'll be presenting, we can't even call it a once in a lifetime show, it's just a unique once only show. When the Frick Collection in New York City, the collection of art assembled by Helen's father that's considered one of the great collections of European art anywhere in the world, when it temporarily closes as it prepares to reopen to the public with expanded and refurbished spaces, they will be lending approximately 60 treasures to our venue. And part of this special exhibition will involve bringing back to Pittsburgh a painting by Vermeer that once hung in Clayton. I think this slide is very deceiving. The actual picture is closer to the top of the podium. <laughs> We'll be able to borrow Rembrandt's extraordinary self-portrait to think about this amazing Titian of the man in the red cap. And one of the great works acquired after Henry Clay Frick's death and at a time when Helen was active on the board of trustees of her father's museum, this exquisite portrait by Ancre. In the years that follow, I'll give you just one taste of what to expect. A wonderful series of prints by the African-American artist Kara Walker that reimagines some of Winslow Homer's prints of the Civil War. In particular, a set of prints that Henry Clay Frick owned and used to teach his children about American history. <coughs> we do all of this, of course, because we recognize that there is plenty of room at the Frick for anyone who would be interested in visiting us. Our dream is that regular days will become as busy as summer Fridays, and that we'll see many more members of our community feeling just as at home at the Frick inside our galleries as they currently do when they're lined up in front of the food trucks. I'm happy to answer questions about the Frick to talk more about our history, but before I do, I wanted to point out as a thank you for turning out and making me your Valentine tonight, we have coffee loyalty cards for the cafe, free guest admission passes, <laughs> bookmarks, and last but not least, a very handsome flyer that advertises the Great Migration Show. And they're all on the back table. 
where I know you'll be stopping to renew your membership in the Historical Society. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I, did you draw, in developing your, your strategic plan, did you draw inspiration from other museums? It's an excellent question, which I will repeat in the microphone for the benefit of the folks at home on Zoom. Um, we did look at other plans as we developed our strategic plan, but it started as a more humble process. The senior leadership team assembled in a single room over the course of a few days and spoke from the heart about the things we were proud of and some of the things that we felt badly about. And we spoke openly that we wished more people knew they were welcome. We wished more members of our community felt that the Frick was a place for them. We felt terrible that not all of our buildings were fully accessible. And the more we talked, the better we felt. There's nothing like sharing your concerns to make them manageable. And we started to chart out plans. So it was organic, but certainly inspired by all of the things we're seeing in the field. With the new illumination you're putting in, will there be evening events at the Frick? Well, a wonderful question about the new nighttime lighting and evening events at the Frick. Um, we are interested in continuing to have evening events, and I should have mentioned that our outside lighting is compliant with international dark skies standards. Mm -hmm. We care very much about the health of the environment and the safety of migrating birds and other animals. So some of the outside events that we are um, imagining that we'll have will actually be about the dark sky. And you can visit our website and watch some of the wonderful lectures we've offered over the past two years as we've learned more about that. What was the significance of the blue color in um, Ms. Germany's works? Um, Vanessa German selected indigo as the color for her dancers because it's, in some African cultures, a color associated with mourning. I think she was also interested in reminding viewers of the dance that indigo and its process of harvesting is an African tradition that was adapted here. Um, and I think she was telling us more of a global story about African contributions to visual culture. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you have any uh, ongoing uh, relationship with the Frick in New York? By the way, very excited to hear that <laughs> these uh, we are treasures will be here. <laughs> the, the Frick Collection in New York City is a separate 501c3, and for many years we were friendly siblings who rarely saw one another. But interestingly, we've become much closer. I'm in regular contact with my counterpart and with the chief curator. In fact, the entire curatorial team paid us a visit last summer. And we are interested in having more frequent conversations. We were honored when the Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Working Council of the Frick Collection learned about the work we were performing and asked to meet with us. So I think we're seeing them next week, virtually. Um, our marketing teams have regular connections. The educators are like peas in a pod. And our wonderful colleagues at the Frick Art Reference Library are incredibly gracious and patient in answering all of our requests. So nothing is formal, but in many ways, it's even better. We're very friendly and we feel like family. a question, but um, I just wanted to say that I've been there um, a few times now for walking tours around the grounds for the Arboretum side of the Frick with the Tree Pittsburgh people, and it is absolutely wonderful. So if anybody, you know, whenever they do one, if other people are interested in that, they do a wonderful job. We offer an annual tree walk led by Tree Pittsburgh that is phenomenal. Everything I know about trees, I learned from the tree walk. We used to offer one tree walk a year, but it's too good to keep to just one iteration, so we've tripled it. And we may do more programming with Tree Pittsburgh. We're also really fortunate to have Grow Pittsburgh as a treasured neighborhood partner. They grow some of their seedlings in part of our greenhouse, and we will have the seedling sale this spring. Mm -hmm. It's back, and it's a wonderful way to get your garden started. 
I just had a comment. When you started, and, and, and I knew from what we'd written about your talk that you were going to speak to your efforts in promoting diversity. Um, and I, was, I, I wrote an article years ago for the Historical Society on a, a naturalist from Frick Park who struggled for years with trying to promote diversity in programming. And then when you started by introducing Vanessa German, and, I mean, that's exactly what you need to do to really give the community ownership of, of the museum. I think it's the most important thing we can do. People may notice the fresh coat of paint on the outside of Clayton someday when I retire, but the really critical thing will be if the people who are noticing it don't all look like me. Well, Lizzie, thank you very much for just a <laughs> opening up of the museum is really exciting, and I'm looking forward to uh, participating in these. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, okay, I've got to promote several things. Uh, we have calendars in the back. They're twenty dollars. They're a fundraiser for the uh, for the society. Please, you know, at least check them out. Uh, we have a flyer here from one of our past speakers, uh, who uh, uh, whose work has been converted into a play that will be uh, presented by uh, Prime Stage. And uh, check www.primestage.com. Uh, should be very interesting, called Perseverance. Uh, now, next speaker uh, will be Charles Suka, who's the city archivist for, for Pittsburgh. And uh, he will describe what the archivist does, what the archivist has, and will focus on photographs of the Lower Hill District, the history thereof. Uh, he's a local, I have to read this, he's a local hist uh, uh, historian who runs several Instagram accounts dedicated to Pittsburgh history, currently writing a book on our numerous city steps, which by the way, there's a set of steps up on Lilac Street where we live that needs to be Reopen. <laughs> oh, all right. And uh, uh, thank you again. We've had such a nice start. Um, Helen? There's one more announcement. Is Tammy Hepps, if you are familiar with her, is going to give a talk. What's the date? Uh, at CMU. It's on is, um, February 23rd. At five to six, five to six, and it's on demographics and the census and data, democracy, and the census. So there's flyers back there for that too. I didn't want to forget that. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Al. Uh, this will close the meeting. I'm to remind everybody to help with uh, taking the chairs back to the uh, to the back room. And uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for presenting. It's wonderful.